What's up my friends, welcome back! I'm starting a new video series with short videos that will provide basic knowledge about electronic components. It is very important to know how each of the most common components work in order to be able to use them in our projects. Today we'll start with the first component of this video series, the operational amplifier, or better known as an op-amp. We will take a look over the most common configuration of these amplifiers, how to use them in different situations, and finally we will take our breadboard and see some real tests. For example, here I have the LM324 operational amplifier, which basically are 4 op-amps in just one IC. It is not the best there is, but will work just fine for our examples and see how they work. So guys, using this IC, we will take a look over the comparator configuration, the voltage follower and why we need a voltage follower. Next, we will see the non-inverting and the inverting configuration and finally take a short look over the derivative and integral configuration of these op-amps. Well guys, let's prepare our breadboard and see some basic examples. So let's get started! This project is brought to you by JLC PCB, which is a manufacturer of quick PCB prototypes for more than 10 years and is the site that I use for all of my PCBs. Once designed, upload your Gerbil files on the JLC PCB site. Get a full review of the PCB, select your desired settings and order the PCB for amazing prices. I've ordered 10 of my prototype PCBs for only $2 and received those in 6 days. Crazy, right? So order your quality PCB and make your projects look a lot more professional. What's up my friends, welcome back! These are the configuration that we will study today. First of all, let's start with the most basic configuration of them all. The comparator, which is basically just the op-amp and nothing more. But before that, this is an operational amplifier IC, the LM324. This is its pinout and this is the basic op-amp symbol, just a triangle with 5 pins. Those pins are called positive and negative input, the output and the positive and negative supply of the amplifier. In this entire tutorial we'll talk about the ideal amplifier, but in real life all its aspects won't be perfect. First ideal spec of the amplifier is that its input impedance is practically infinite, so no current could flow towards the amplifier on the input rails. Second spec is that the output impedance is low and current could flow inwards and outwards to the main supply. Third ideal law and very important one is that the voltage on the positive and negative input will always be the same, or at least the op amp will try that, even it won't succeed. Finally, one more ideal law, the gain of an operational amplifier is very big, or almost infinite. But of course, it won't amplify the input signal by infinite. One obvious thing is that the output could have its maximum value the supply of the op amp. It can be higher or lower than that. So even with gain infinite, the output will saturate at the input value. Great guys, using this basic ideal loss, let's talk about the comparator configuration. As its name tells us, this configuration will compare which of the inputs is higher. It works like this. The output of this configuration is the difference between the two inputs, multiplied by the amplifier gain. Since the gain is infinite, whenever the positive input is lower than the negative, we will have a negative output. And when the positive is higher than the negative, a positive output. Now I place the LM324 on the breadboard and supply positive and negative 12 volts to the supply pins. Now I connect ground to the negative input of the amplifier and the output to my oscilloscope. At the positive input I will apply a sine wave with values from minus 2 to 2 volts. The yellow line on my oscilloscope is the input and the green is the output. As you can see when the input value is above ground the output is positive and when the input is below ground we have a negative output. That's how this configuration works. So when we should use this example? Well, go and watch my tutorial on the Arduino Base RPM meter. It has an infrared sensor inside that gives a higher value each time it detects reflected light. But the signal that gives is very low and oscillating a lot and the Arduino can't read that. In order to pass that signal to digital values that the Arduino could read, I've used this configuration and set the negative input to a value right below the peaks of the voltage that the sensor gives and that resulted in a digital square wave that my Arduino could now read. 
Now let's see a limitation of this op amp. At the output I will place a potentiometer, so I could vary the output load value. When the low is high, we have no problem. But when I start lowering its value, we can see that the output gets saturated. That's because the op amp has an output current limit. Right in this moment, if we look at the output maximum voltage and then we measure the potentiometer value without changing its value, we could obtain the current limit. Or maybe just check the datasheet of the amplifier. Well, guys, let's see the next example, the voltage follower. This is the configuration for this example, and as you can see, we have now added this connection here, that is called feedback, a negative feedback. One of the laws before was that the op amp will try to make the voltage at the negative input equal to the one at the positive input. By other ideal law, we know that no current could flow toward the input rails. So, the only way to change the voltage at the negative pin here is towards the feedback. Now let's imagine we put 5 volts at the positive input. The op amp internally will do all it has to do in order to put exactly 5 volts at the output and at the same time to the negative input with the feedback. So, now we have the same value at the output as at the input, that's why it's called a follower. But you must wonder, what stupid thing is this? Why apply 5 volts and obtain 5 volts as well? Well, imagine this. Imagine that you have a circuit that works at let's say 3 volts. I will draw that just as a black box for this example, since we don't really care what circuit that is. Now let's say that you want to connect to that circuit and measure the voltage. If you put a low impedance probe to it, current will flow through that connected rail and by that we change the circuit value and we don't want that. We don't want to measure the wrong values. We want the real one, so for that, between the measure circuit and our connection, we put a voltage follower. In this way, no current will flow towards the measuring device, and by that we won't affect the measure circuit, but we still have the real voltage at the output. I've mounted this configuration on my breadboard and apply a sine wave to it. As you can see, the output is the same as the input, and no current is flowing towards the op amp. Ok guys, let's take a look at the next configuration, the inverting one. Since we have just looked at the voltage follower circuit, instead of having just a simple connection between the output and the negative input, let's add a resistor to that connection, and another resistor at the negative input, and connect the positive input to ground. Now let's apply real values, so we could better understand how this works. If the first resistor is 100 ohms and the second is 10, and we apply 1 volts to the input, this will happen. A current will flow to R2. That current value is the input minus the voltage at the negative input point, divided by R2. But the voltage at the negative point must be the same as the one at the positive input, in this case ground. We call this virtual ground, since we don't really have a ground at that negative pin. Since no current could flow towards the op amp, the only route that the current could take is through the negative feedback rail. This current value could also be expressed like the difference between the negative pin and the output, divided by R1. Since the negative input is ground, all we are left with is that the negative output divided by R1 is the current value. But this is the same value as current 1. From these two equations, we get that the gain, which is expressed in the output divided by the input, is negative R1 divided by R2. And there is our amplification. R1 is 100, and R2 is 10, so the gain is minus 10 in this case. So, if we apply 1 volts at the input, we get negative 10 at the output, and vice versa. That's why it is called inverted, since the output is inverted to the input, and just by changing the resistor values, we can change the gain of the amplifier. Now I mount this circuit on my breadboard with resistor values of 110 kilo ohms. I supply positive and negative 12 volts to the amplifier and apply a 1 volt peak to peak sine wave at the input. Now on the oscilloscope, the yellow line is the input and the green is the output. As you can see, the output is 10 times bigger and also inverted. When the input is rising, the output is falling and vice versa. Finally, let's talk about the non inverting configuration. This is its schematic. Now the positive pin is our main input of the circuit, and the feedback is still connected at the negative input. Now, as before, the negative pin value is the same as the positive input, in this case let's call it Vin. 
the current that passes through R2 is V in minus ground, divided by R2. And the current through R1 is V out minus V in, divided by R1. But we know once again that these two currents are equal. So, solving these two equations, we get that the gain of this configuration is 1 plus R1 divided by R2. I mount this example on the breadboard using 110 kilo ohms resistor for R1 and R2. I supply power to the amplifier and once again apply a sine wave at the input of 1 volt peak to peak. On the oscilloscope, again, the input with yellow and the output with green, and we can see that the output is 11 times higher and that is not inverted. So, depending on what you want for your project, just use one configuration or the other. You could even connect two amplifiers in series and have double amplification or double inverted signal so the output won't be inverted. Well, guys, just as an extra, I will show you the schematics for the differential and integral configuration. As you can see now, we have some capacitor as well. With these configurations, by applying a square wave at the input, you could easily obtain a ramp. Also, the derivative of a sine wave is a cosine wave, as you can see here on my oscilloscope. So there you go my friends, now you know a bit more about basic op-amps. One interesting configuration is a PID controller where we use the integrator, differential, inverter and summer configuration of the op-amps and by changing the resistor and capacitor values we can tune the PID response. Well guys, there you have it, stay tuned for the next basic components tutorial where we'll take a look at another component. Have in mind that I explain only the ideal laws of the op-amps. In real life this won't be exactly like this, since each component will have its limitations, such as no infinite input impedance, output current limitation, bad common input amplification and so on. Please check the description of this video for all the configurations and more details on my webpage electronoops.com. Also check my videos where I've used the RPMs, like the RPM meter and the AC current probe to amplify a magnetic field sensor. I even made a crude 3-bit ADC using RPMs. So even this tutorial is very basic, I hope that you learned something about op-amps. Well guys, I hope that you enjoyed this tutorial. If so, don't forget to click the like button like crazy and share this video with your friends. If you have any question about this video or any other, just leave it in the comment section below or my Q&A page. Also, don't forget to subscribe and watch all of my other great tutorials. Remember, if you consider helping my projects, check my Patreon page as well. Thanks again and see you later guys.